Hello, tech fans, and welcome in to episode 184 of the Tech Sideline podcast, originating from TSL's High Tech Studios in the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. On today's podcast, we are beyond thrilled and excited to welcome on the head football coach of the Virginia Tech Hokies, Justin Fuente, who is with us on set to talk about the program, the season ahead. We've got some fun questions at the end and more as we record on Tuesday morning, July 20th. We've got a great show ahead, and we're so glad you are with us. Episode 184 of the Tech Sideline Podcast gets started right now. Welcome back in, folks. No, your eyes are not deceiving you. Evan did not suddenly turn into me. This is uh, Will Stewart, <laughs> Tech Sideline founder and, and general manager. I'll be, Chris Coleman and I will be doing the rest of the podcast with Coach Fu uh, off camera, but mic'd up, we've got Evan. Evan's going to be doing some support, and he will be doing a uh, fun with Fu, a TTL type uh, fun with Fu segment at the end. So uh, we're looking forward to that. We've got Coach for about an hour. And of course, to my left is uh, analyst and columnist Chris Coleman. And across the way, we've got the man, the myth, the legend, Justin Fuente. Coach, appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to come on with us. You bet. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So when we built this set two years ago, the vision was to one day have Justin Fuente walk through that door, sit down and, and do, do a podcast with awesome. us. Awesome. So. Well, let's just... Let's do it. Uh, let's just make it a, a, a normal thing. How's yep. that? All right. So you got a busy week going on. Tell us about what you got, got going on this week, including yesterday. Well, yesterday we had a really an awesome event. About 1,200 Hokies in Richmond um, got together to, you know, this week is ACC Media, kick, uh, ACC Media Days, and it's usually our kickoff tours. And I think I don't want to put – put words in Brad Wortham's mouth, but I, I think we're, we're going through some changes in how all those things, all those kickoff luncheons are, are done. Uh, I'm anxious and excited to see what they look like in the future. If yesterday is any indication of, of what we're looking at doing, I mean, I, there was a, a definite buzz in the air. First of all, I think everybody's happy just to be back together, to have an opportunity to, to hang out and fellowship and uh, like I said, about 1,200 Hokies from the, from the Richmond area. Some drove from from far off at the Hardywood Brewery to 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 really fellowship and um, talk a little football. We had uh, Burnup and Laser there, and uh, Jaden Payute joined us. Obviously, a Richmond Richmond kid that uh, was cool to see his his mama made the trip out there too. So, uh, really a fun event. Then uh, we'll fly out today for media days tomorrow in Charlotte to, to, to go do those sorts of things. And then we've got one full week next week of preparation and then a half a week the week after that. And we, and we kick this thing off reporting on the 4th and practicing on the 5th. So I, I did see the pictures from the Hardywood Brewery. That was very cool. So I have to ask you, did you sample the beer? You know, I, when, one thing that I, I know about myself, I have had the beer before, very good. I'm not a beer connoisseur, but it was, it, was, it was very good. But I know public speaking and alcohol don't go very, uh, together very well. So I'm usually a hard pass whenever I've got to get up on stage to, to go talk. But um, that's really a cool, uh, a cool setup there and, 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 a, and a cool event and, and, a, and a quality product. Yeah, the, the Richmond Hockey Club, uh, the, the football kickoff thing, is, it's got a long history. Uh, it, 1,200 people is probably the most they've ever had. They've had Aaron Andrews and Kirk Herbstreet, a special guest there for their yeah. kickoff event in the summer before. Yeah, yeah, so it's always a big, big thing. So they had a three-year run back there in the mid-2000s where I can't remember what order it was in. I think it went Kirk Herbstreet, Aaron Andrews, and uh, Chris Fowler came in to speak. You got one guess as to which one was the most fun out of those three. Uh, Aaron Andrews. Aaron Andrews, exactly. Was she? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kirk was uh, very businesslike. He went back to the hotel afterwards. Aaron actually went out with the Richmond Hokie Club people. Oh, really? And, had yeah. a good time, huh? She's a lot of fun. She's a great person. So um, that said, let's launch into some things here. And I, and I wanted to tee up with this question. You know, it's 
Of course, part of this answer is, is going to include the word COVID a lot. But uh, just kind of look at look at where we are now. What is today? July 20th? July 20th and think about July 20th, 2020. And it's not just that it's not COVID anymore. It's that you have more and different staff. You've got facilities that have been completed. So kind of talk about where the program as a whole is right now and how you feel about it versus where you were about a year ago. Well, I've, I've really never felt better. And quite honestly, I felt really good last year. It's just COVID, like, through our op- – for everybody. Yeah. I mean, we weren't unique. But, um, you know, that threw a whole nother element of, obviously, what we were dealing with into, uh, into play. But if you start to really sit back and look at what our kids are doing – uh, who's in our program, um, you start to look at our grades, you know, in the last four semesters, we've continued to get better, the best four semesters in the history of Virginia Tech football. Um, you start to look at what our off season looks like, what our practices look like, uh, what they look like in the spring. You start to get, get really, really excited about not just the, the talent level, but the quality of people that we've got out there on the field. And, you know, we went through – a huge growing pain or a huge turnover on our staff over a year ago. And I loved what we did. And, um, but we never had a chance to put it all together. And then through COVID and, and all those sorts of things. And then we went through a little bit of a change heading into this year. And nobody wanted to lose Daryl Tapp. I can promise yeah. you that. Um, you know, but. That was his dream situation. And Daryl and I had had that conversation months before that opportunity even came up. And, but if you're going to lose him, J.C. Price is who you want to replace him with. And uh, those guys have really hit the ground running and done a great job uh, meshing with our staff, meshing with our players, getting an opportunity to go through spring ball and recruiting. You know, we're reaping the benefits of a lot of hard work over the last, the last two years. But – you know, last year was just so abnormal in every single way. Um, it was just, you know, it was, it was it was a really unique situation, and through we were a little bit of a victim of circumstances on, on a couple of things, but uh, I couldn't be more excited or more proud of where we're going. While everything was shut down, we were still building things. Yeah. You know, like, and <clears throat> you're starting to see that is you know while uh, COVID was rough on everybody's budget and was you know, certainly a safety issue. Uh, them guys and gals were still uh, hammering boards and sawing, you know, hammering nails and sawing boards. I mean, they were still building things. The the dining facility, the, the weight room, our new players' lounge will be done to start the season. Uh, you get pretty excited about everything that's going on. So from a recruiting standpoint, a lot of recruits, they hadn't visited Blacksburg since 2019. Some of them hadn't visited at all. And all of a sudden, they come back two years later or a year and a half later, and all these brand new facilities are up, a dorm, uh, new meeting rooms, everything. So it's it's almost like a different experience visiting Virginia Tech now, I would have to think. Well, it's what we set out to do when we started. You know, like, you know, Whit and I, when, when we, we got into this, you know, we, we knew we had some facility deficits. Um, we had just completed the beautiful indoor facility, but we knew there were still things that the dorm uh, was something that we, we knew we needed to address. And with the help of the university, we've been able to address that. Those things just take time, you know, and we're beginning to reap some of the benefits of that and now shifting our attention, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, towards staffing, you know, in terms of, of continuing to build that staff up. But, you know, four years ago, we knew we were behind in both areas and, you know, we couldn't do all of everything. So, um, you know, it's been nice to get people back on campus and say, oh, those drawings, you know, those pictures you kept showing me that, um, you know, they didn't do justice to what's actually here and which is a a beautiful facility. And we can't stop there, you know, like and I'm not talking about uh, waterfalls in the locker room and, you know, crazy things. But, you know, we've got to continue to 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 show these young people that that we're going to provide them the best opportunity to develop in 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 four areas of their life they're going to develop academically uh, develop athletically develop socially and spiritually and we've got to show them through um through philanthropy through the university helping out through facilities through support staff 
that we're dedicated to their to their future, and we're well on our way to doing that. When, when you walk recruits through the new facilities, which which one would you say has has the most pop that that really speaks to the recruits the most? Well, I mean, I it's a little bit difficult uh, thing. We haven't been in the new dorm yet, so right. I'm hopeful that we'll we'll be able to be in it and. Um, you know, Are you I, able to even walk through it at all? No, and I asked a lot. I asked <laughs> several times. They finally called and said, Coach Fuente, you cannot take families through a construction zone. Quit asking. You know, so um, – but I, I'm, I feel fairly confident that in uh, very short order we'll be able to at least just walk through there. So we haven't – I haven't actually seen the inside of it yet. Um, but, you know, you know, the dining facility is beautiful, but what's – you know, what makes a dining facility is the food, right? So when yeah. you sit down and eat and and realize what a great chef we have and what a great staff we have and, and, and the quality of product that's in there, that's pretty pretty eye opening. Uh, our weight room is is incredible and you know, it's a little bit of an existing space but revamped a little bit that that really looks nice. The biggest improvement is probably our position meeting rooms. I mean those were you know, to to put it to put it Kind of, they were severely outdated, and they're uh, they're very nice. So it's it's a little bit hard to deal. But when those kids sit down and have a nice meal in that dining facility, that that gets their attention pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. So um, where where this sounds like an odd off the wall question, but where are the coaches' offices these days? Are you guys in in uh, Merriman Center? Are you are they down right off the weight room? Are they more up in their meeting rooms? Where are the coaches? No, they're in the same time? spots they've been ever since I've been here. Yeah. Um, the the position meeting rooms are what's now above basically what's happened is there's another hallway above the weight room for another row of position meeting rooms okay so yeah. that's been all been that redone but they're all in the same spot there's just more square footage and it's been cl completely redone yeah. okay i got you uh so you talk about you know staff members and that's the next step but to me it seems like ever since the end of the 2019 season with some of your coaching hires it's really been an in-state focus to a certain extent, you know, obviously Daryl Tapp, but he's gone, but replacing him with J.C. Price, Jack Tyler's a Virginia guy, Ryan Smith seems to be doing a great job in Richmond. You know, combining these guys, these fresh faces on the staff with new facilities has, has got to make a big impact in your eyes, I think. Well, it does, and I'm just going to be completely honest. Those guys are also really good at their job. You know, mm -hmm. if they were from Maine, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't matter. But – they they happen to be from Virginia and they're really competent. Just because you're from here doesn't mean you can recruit here. We've seen that. So um, I'm really excited. You know, uh, Ryan Smith is a young, uh, really up and coming coach, and Jack Tyler. What I'm proud of is he's a young up and coming coach that we kind of brought through our farm system, which is how I envision our our quality control growing that program. Our our QC slash analyst uh, analyst program is is have an older guy in there like like Tanuda, like we have in there now, but also bring some young, hungry coaches up through the ranks through there. And Jack's a product of that. Um, but yeah, we well, certainly, you know, it's it it must be a point of emphasis. What we've it's always been a point of emphasis. We've just gotten better at it. Yeah. And uh, these guys uh, that you mentioned, the, the guys on our staff, Adam Lechtenberg's made a huge difference. And uh, you know, he's not very tall and he's not very imposing and he's certainly not intimidating, but all he does is outwork everybody. You know, he's raised on a farm in Nebraska and he uh, is in, in touch with all, all of our recruits and just does a, a really good job. So basically, we've gotten better. You know, we're, our facilities have gotten better. Uh, really proud of our staff and the, and the job that they're doing. And we're starting to reap some of those benefits. So there's been a kind of continuing along in that same vein with with the football enhancement fund there's been a focus on staffing not just coaches but staffing in general uh you know fairly recently within the last year or so and so what what is your overall vision for the the staff as a whole including recruiting support staff analysts that sort of thing and how close are you being able to fill that out and, and flesh it out and get it where you want it well we're closer i mean we we still have i don't know on the recruiting side 25% left to go I think in the next couple of years maybe maybe a little bit more um, you know we, we build out that I am proud with the with the progress we've made you know I think trying to count on the top seven or eight full-time people we've got in there and then you start to count some assistants that 
and a graduate assistant here or there, but there's still plenty of room for growth in that. And and there's going to need to be in 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 the recruiting area because it's going to it, it's becoming a twofold approach, right? It's the high school evaluation and recruitment, and it's the free agent market. It's just like the NFL now. So the NFL has to evaluate the college prospects and the and the prospects on other teams that are that are free agents and. And we'll have to do the same thing. There's 25 kids in the portal every single day. Well, every all every 20 all 25 of those guys got to be evaluated. We got to figure it out. Well, I, I can't do that. We've got to have a group of people that can continue to, to to disseminate the information up through the ranks so that we can figure out who's a, who's a fit for us. So the number of people uh, is certainly expanding. And then you start to talk about the graphics and uh, on campus. Um, organizers and all those all those sorts of things so there's we've done a nice job i'm excited about it we certainly don't need to quit when well, we've got to continue to grow that and i don't want people stacked on top of people just so we can have people stand around like that's not i'm not into that i hope people know me well enough to know by now that you know i don't um i'm not into that like i want us to have a clear plan for as we incrementally add people to the staff and the same is true with our analysts and quality control coaches and those guys help coach i mean they they i should reset what i meant to say is they help recruit i mean they're they're active when people are on campus they just can't go out so they help there's some crossover there into into that realm that i think we need to continue and i know we do and wit 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 knows this too that we got to continue to grow it seems like there's been an added emphasis the last couple of classes on maybe getting some more length at defensive end um, can you talk about your philosophies there? Or maybe are they Justin Hamilton's philosophies as a defensive coach? Well, I, I, we need more length everywhere, not just at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, we we, um, we found ourselves in a situation a couple of years ago where we were uh, a really short defensive football team, quite honestly. Yeah. You know, and um, that hurt us in the Kentucky game. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just not very long. And we needed to get a little bit longer, more athletic. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. We've been trying to get a little bit longer at linebacker too. Virginia Tech, in general terms, so maybe some Virginia Tech historians would be upset with me. And but just talking to Bud about, you know, we've been um, historically long in the back end. Mm -hmm. You yep. know, that's where the length. I know when I first saw us practice, I was I was taken aback a little bit about how tall we were in the secondary, uh, and and how short we were in the front. You right. know, and uh, I think I think we need to try to lengthen up a little bit uh, in the in the front end to take a little space away, uh, you know, to help us out by still trying to become still trying to be a a longer team in the back end. Well, Panay moved to defensive end. Do you yes. Think with, okay. He did today. He did today. Yeah, just met with him. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you this, um, you know, w w what attracted us to Wheel from the beginning was that we really believed he was a guy that could play either way. And I really think he, he's got a chance to play uh, either side of the ball. Like, I'm, we're not done with him at tight end. He's got a chance to be an on-the-ball tight end that moves people. This is a big, strong kid now. Yeah. So, um, you know, but obviously, you know, he's got a little bit of interest in, in trying to figure out what his long-term potential is in terms of what would be the best for him. In the short term, I think we would be better off moving him over there and then evaluate it at the end of the year and see what Will thinks and what we think about where he can be. But obviously, that'll help us a little bit in the short term because I know he can walk over there and do it. He's physically ready. Mm. You just got to figure out which direction to go. It takes a lot of bravery, I would say, to move when you're 17 years old to another country where you don't speak the language. And it's, you know, it's not like a summer internship in Switzerland or something where you got your friends there and a lot of people already speak the same language. I mean, he goes by himself at the age of 17 and has to learn a new language. Uh, that's got to be that type of mentality has got to be part of what attracted you to him in the recruiting process. Absolutely. I mean, um, that takes a special, a special person. And that gives you the feeling that, first of all, there's trust. And second of all, there's um, a level of stick to to yeah. that person. You know, a little bit of level of self-confidence that this is really important to them, that they would like to really go see if they, they can make this work. And... Um, you know, when you're trying to answer all those questions in recruiting, 
You know, Will's an under recruited guy that I think's a lot, you know, has a chance to be a lot better player than he was actually recruited. But when you start checking all those boxes you're talking about, on top of being tall enough, being long enough, being athletic enough, uh, you start to get really excited and you don't care who else is recruiting them. You want to get them in your program. And, um, and I don't want to build Will up to be the next Lawrence Taylor, but I'm just saying, you know, those are the type of guys that, that really excite you about a chance to have a really positive impact on your program. So if we're going to talk about the roster, can you can you clear up the running back room for us at all at this point, getting ready to go into fall camp? Well, I mean, I there's going to be three young guys that are going to get a, a really good opportunity, or three um, three freshmen that are in the middle of having a, a really good really good summer. Um, you know, but the older guys, to me, Jalen Holston uh, and Raheem Blackshear, you know, those are the two guys that we're heading into fall camp. Seeing we need Keyshawn King to continue to or to, to be more consistent. I think if he would do that, he would be right in, uh, right in the mix. Um, uh, Marco Lee has had, a, had no chance last year, just between COVID and not being in good enough shape. But now he's had a really good summer. He's got a chance to, to have a role in there um, to see. So it's all going to work itself out. You know, like, well, it'll all be, it'll all be good in the long run. Um, we got to get into fall fall camp to clear it up a little bit more. But I feel like I've got a decent idea of these older guys that have played a lot and these these young guys that, that are going to have a chance to, to try and make an impact. Kelly Lawson, a guy who seemed like he was recruited as a linebacker, uh, <laughs> listed as a wide receiver now on the roster, uh, appears to be a really good overall versatile athlete. Uh, what, if he is playing wide receiver, what, what's, your, uh, what's your take on what's the reasoning behind that move? So – you know, when you're an uh, an offensive coach by trade, and you become a head coach, you know you you go out of your way to not rip off the defense, right? right. Like, I, I mean, I want to make sure that you know when Caleb Farley comes along, if we really believe that that he's got a defensive potential, that we do the right thing and don't keep him on offense. When Divine Diablo comes along, and we really believe that that the right thing is for him to play safety, let's go. Let's go do that. And um, when Will Panay needs to move to defense, you know, then yeah. let's go. Then let's go do those things. But this one in recruiting, you know, we really fell in love with Kelly. He was a he'd been hurt. He was a difficult eval. His high school coach, who we have a great relationship with, stood on the table and said, "This kid is incredible athletically and a great human being." And it was just a tif- It was a difficult eval. Because there were plays that you saw, maybe one out of ten, where you're like, man, this guy might even play wide out. Or he might be a linebacker. Or Plus, we don't ever get to see him. Yeah. So, I don't know how big he really is. I mean, it's all during during the shutdown. So, um, we decide that we're going to offer Kelly, and we're going to figure it out. That's basically what we told Kelly. You know, like, uh, I told the defensive staff or the entire staff, I said, we're going to bring Kelly in. You know, after we got through signing day, we saw where all the, 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 the guys fell and we, we got a, somewhat of a handle on our roster. I said, we're going to bring Kelly in. We're going to give him a chance to play wide out. If he can play wide out, then that's where he's going to play, guys. But we're, you know, we're going to take him over there to start with. And if he can't, we know he can play on the – we know he can run around and has a chance to play linebacker. Then we'll go, we'll go that direction. But we're going to give him a chance. So, you know, he's looked – Good. I haven't, you know, obviously in the summer we're limited on, on what we can we'd see. So I'm anxious to go see him in the fall. I think uh, just listen to the players talk and everybody talk. Everybody feels like he has a, a chance to, to to actually play wide out, but we'll see. Uh, speaking of young wide outs, Jalen Jones, Dwayne Lofton, what's your take on those guys after seeing them for the spring? Studs. Yeah. I mean, they've had really, really good summers. They seem to pick things up really quickly. You know, we have some older guys at wide out. So, you know, I'm not I'm not saying they're going to walk in and, and play 80 snaps a game. But I'm just saying those are two guys that are focused, that are mature beyond beyond their age. Um, you know, D-Loft, I was, you know, his high school coach. I was his high school coach's position coach in college. And, you know, he's been, he's been great. And Jalen's been right there with him. I'm, I'm really pleased with both the physical development, the mental development of those two guys. They, 
I think they have a bright future. I'm really interested in Jalen Jones. He came from a high school where I think they play on Saturday afternoons because they don't have lights in their stadium. They can't play on Friday nights. They haven't produced a Power 5 player since the 70s. And, you know, a lot of coaching staffs will ignore schools like that because they haven't re- produced a player in decades. So why recruit it? How did you guys get in on, on Jalen Jones? Well, I'll tell you, that attracted me to him because he didn't leave his school. Mm-hmm. I mean, he could have gone to – who knows however many different schools in the Richmond area. Uh, but he didn't. He stayed with a, a school that traditionally hadn't been very good and hadn't produced a lot of big time players because he was loyal to the coaches, he was loyal to the school, he was loyal to his the guys he'd been playing with since he'd been growing up. And yeah, he had buddies that were playing at the other, you know, powerhouse schools that, that we all know in, in Richmond that uh, you know, he could have probably easily found a way to end up over there, but he didn't. So to me, that was attractive. I mean, we we saw his film, and again, it was it was a, a tough eval just throughout the whole period. But um, really, began to become really comfortable with him, and and feel really good about about his ability to to play. I'm, I'm over here chuckling, guys. Loyalty to school is a valuable commodity these days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So uh, I, want, I wanted to back up a little bit, and, and I know coaches aren't excuse makers, you know, but I did want to explore a topic with you. Virginia Tech was in not a unique position, but I, I feel like COVID was more challenging for you guys than a lot of other schools because, number one, your, your facilities were in flux. Your, your, your weight room was being worked on and really wasn't available. Um, you did not have a centralized nutrition center like what you have now. Um, and you you had changed staff. You had a you had a different defensive staff. You didn't get a chance to install the defense in the spring. And then when you came back in the fall, of course, players in and out due to COVID. And uh, I I think, and I kind of want you to dis- to discuss this. Schools like that at the made changes didn't get a chance to put their systems in. Were at a, at a deficit compared to other schools. You look at uh, LSU. They changed offensive and defensive coordinators. And they had a bad year. And that, that, how big of a role did that play? And and one of the things that makes me ask this is, you know, Athlon's always doing that thing where they ask coaches to speak about other programs off the record. And there was a coach who said that Virginia Tech's defense kind of looked like it was all over the place last year in, in, in terms of scheme and what they were trying to do. So talk about the, how much of a well, challenge that, that was. That's true. And, you know, and I appreciate you prefacing that with the, you know, the excuse part because I'm not like it was challenging for everybody everybody had their it was different it was challenging in different ways for everybody too and certainly not having spring ball but that's pretty much par for for everybody in the ACC what killed us was we had no fall camp either it lasted eight weeks but we had no I mean we had nobody there to practice and (laughs) <laughs> it was just the most difficult thing I've ever been through. We had no identity. And, and you kept that pretty quiet. You didn't really go public with the lack of availability of players. Well, I mean, I don't like building excuses in before even, you know what I mean? Like there's yeah. a little bit of whininess that I try to avoid in that deal. But like, I mean, it was, uh, it was as, I don't know if harrowing is a word is the right word, but it was as stressful. We just, fall camp is awesome, Right. You, 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 before fall camp comes up, you bring your, your wife and your daughters up, you give them a big hug and a big kiss, you send them off to go see the in-laws, and you go do football 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's fantastic. And, you know, every coach in America loves fall camp. And this was like the, the most – nobody knew who's going to be there. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then it, it's a little depressing. You know, like you're out there at practice and there's, you know, a bunch of guys that aren't there. Some of them are contact trace. Some of them, anyway, y'all understand that. So it really affected us with that. And what really affected us too is when we did start to play, it was nine straight weeks. Right. So now we're trying to get better established identity and game plan every single week. Then after nine weeks, I mean, we're, we're smoked. I mean, we're, we haven't had a bye week. We haven't, and I knew the team was tired, you know, six weeks into it or seven weeks into it, but I, I couldn't stop it. It was like a snowball rolling down the hill. We were getting over COVID, 
but we were so emotionally and mentally just smoked like we we couldn't we couldn't get it get it back and the bye week was huge for us we did less on that bye week than we than we've ever done and you can see and we didn't you know we we played clemson and virginia and all i'll say is that those two team or that team that we put on the field was energized you know and not just because of rivalry not just because of clemson because they were they were refreshed and they at least had a fighting chance yeah. so one, one more question then we'll take it to break um uh, talk about the decision to not go to a bowl game uh, my guess is that you followed what the players wanted on that one. Um, and, and I know you've probably addressed this publicly, but I did want to talk about it here. How did, how did the team as a whole come to that decision? Well, they did, and it was divided. I mean, there was a, there was a large, you know, there was – I don't remember what the percentage is, but, but it was not a unanimous decision. But we weren't going to go play unless we were unanimous to go play. Right. And, you know, there were some guys that, you know, were pretty disappointed. But, you know, by and large – and we knew the – you know the the streak, yeah. yeah. But I'm just telling the guys were, the guys were at their wits end. I mean, it was just that difficult, and it wasn't the record. It was it was what we were dealing with yeah. that was just really really. And you saw a bunch of teams. I don't know how many teams did and how many teams didn't, but I I would venture to guess there may have been more ACC teams say say we're passing than other leagues. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know, you know I felt like there were several teams in our league that said, we've done our job. You know, well, that's kind of how we felt like we were doing. We were out there to go play. Just to make sure there's a season. To make right. sure there was a season, quite honestly, to help the athletic department, you know, to make sure that yeah. the, the the money came. Yeah. Now, we wanted to win ball games and all that kind of stuff, but we felt like we'd, we'd the kids felt like they'd push that thing as, as far as they were willing to go. And but if they you were go to a bowl, you want to have a chance to win it. And if a good chunk of the players aren't all in on it, you're And not. I think a lot of them would have played and they would have gone along with it. I don't mm -hmm. think there was going to be a deal where, you know, there was, you know, Christian Darisol may not have played in it, right? right? But um, I, it was just a deal where, like, I was like, if we're going to go do this, we're all going to go do this. And – you know, we couldn't get to that point. Yeah. Well, it's not only that, but, you know, bowl games are often some sort of destination, and then there's a whole week of activities and things like that. And you wouldn't have gotten any of that. It no. would have been go in, play the game, and go Stay back Stay in a hotel for a week and, or whatever. And yeah. It's really it. unfortunate. You know, I feel terrible for the whole thing to end, you know, like that. We have an opportunity to, to start another one. But it was just – ultimately, I, f I felt like the players made the right decision. That's how yeah. I felt. I did not – push them any any direction i wanted them to have control of it yeah. all right we're going to take a short break just a reminder that the tech sideline podcast is sponsored by the southeast regional training center so the big thing the serTC has got going on uh, visit southeastrtc.com they're uh planning for their golf tournament which is going to be on september 10th friday september 10th I'm looking at you, Coach. Uh, you, you like to golf, right? I do like to play. You but should, I, you should I don't challenge. get to play in September. Nah. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> so, do you know off the top of your head, Chris, what game is September 11th, the next day? Uh, who do we play second game, second week of the season? Middle Tennessee. Middle Tennessee. Yeah. Middle Tennessee. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have Tony Roby call you up and, and try to challenge you to come No, no, no. Here. He's got West Virginia the next week. He needs to focus <laughs> There's all plenty on plenty of West work Virginia. going on. Yeah. <laughs> once once uh, about July 20th hits, the golf clubs go away for a while. Yeah. yeah. So, All right, so we'll take a short break and uh, return in a few minutes. All right, so welcome back in. After a much needed break, these chairs are not comfortable, so it's good to get up and move around. And uh, we wanted to tee Chris up next with some more roster-related stuff. I want to talk a little bit about Dorian Strong. It, you know, I thought this past year was probably – it was tough on everybody, but maybe especially tough on the true freshman. 
who didn't get a complete fall camp, and yet he was able to come in as a true freshman and play at a really high level for, for Tech last season. Uh, I go to the gym, or I see his dad in the gym during football season, and if Dorian's got half his dad's work ethic, he's going to end up being a really good football player for, for Tech. Uh, talk about his progress so far as a player and what you made of his freshman season last year. Yeah, well, Dorian needs half his dad's muscles right now. <laughs> he's uh, he's uh... We all do. He's a pretty yoked up, <laughs> yoked up guy. But um, well, I was, you know, all the freshmen had it particularly difficult because we had a case in the middle of fall camp in the dorms, and it just basically either through contact tracing or whatever just wiped everybody out of the dorms for a couple of weeks. Well, that's two weeks of fall camp. Well, yep. Dorian's in that group, and lo and behold, we find ourselves in in week two with with no corners, and Dorian gets a start versus Duke, and um, you know, Dorian and the Deer Thompson are starting two corners, and they played really well. But I felt I just know that the moment I I felt great about Dorian. You know, first of all, this is another kid we had in camp that nobody really knew about that was po po poised to have a great senior year. He had a great senior year, and people came out of the woodworks, and he just said, "I'm not, I'm not interested. I'm still going to Virginia Tech." And then comes in and in the second week is starting and they threw a double move on Dorian to our our boundary and completed it for a I don't know 30 yard gain or whatever and the first thought in my mind went was I'm glad the guy didn't score and how's Dorian going to react right like he just got beat he didn't get beat bad but it was a, a chunk play and he just popped right up, ran back there, and got lined up. You know, it, you know, he wasn't happy about it, but it wasn't a woe is me moment. And it gave you a little window into his competitiveness and his willingness to put himself out there. And I think that holds a lot of kids back nowadays. I think they're so scared about ending up as a, a clip on, on <laughs> Twitter or they're so scared about getting burnt or, you know, whatever it is. It's not just corners, any position. They're a little bit scared to compete. And – uh, you know, part of competing is is failing and, and learning from that and, and, and picking yourself up and, and getting back to work. And in that moment, I felt really good about about him. And he's gone on to have a good a good spring and, uh, you know, in the middle of having a good summer or towards the end of a really good summer that he needed. He's a thin framed guy, but uh, he's got good length, can really run and seems to have a high football IQ. Four corners with starting experience. Now only Ross, you've got to feel really good about depth there. Well, I do. I, you know, we've got a, a lot of guys that have played a lot. You know, you start to think about Armani and Breon that have that have all played. We've got a couple of young guys. I'm anxious to see see get out there, and um, and we'll need them all. You know, that's just the way it goes. COVID or not, you're going to need uh, you're going to need depth and 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 hold your breath at places where you don't have depth. But uh, I feel good that we've got some guys in there with some experience. If you could name switching position groups, if if you could name your uh, your starting five offensive linemen, are you in a position to do that at this point? You know, go going into camp. Oh, uh, I mean, I could name most of them. You know, I, I'm pretty sure Tanuta, Lasita Smith, and Brock Hoffman are going to be in there. Yeah, probably going from left to right. That's that's probably probably what it would look like. Uh, you know, Silas Janzi continues to come on, and you know, is really one of the best the freakiest athletes on our entire team. I mean, the biggest, strongest, one of the biggest, strongest, quickest guys we've got. We've got Terrell Smith back with a chance to compete for a job at, at right tackle. But we got, you know, you know Johnny Jordan, you know, that brings experience that we need. And then we've got a couple of young guys I'm really, really excited about. So I don't know that I could tell you exactly how they're going to trot out there. Coach Feist likes mixing it up particularly early before we settle on something. But – I know three of those guys will be in there, and you know I would imagine Silas will probably get in there to start with at right guard, and um, and maybe Terrell at right tackle because he's you know he's probably earned the right to to jump out there first. Do you see Johnny Jordan at center and uh, Brock Hoffman maybe being a guard? We'll need to have the, those guys do both. Like they'll need to. That's you know the good thing about Brock is Brock can really play. Um, guard and can play tackle if we need him to now um so that we'll need to have a little bit of versatility we've got to identify the best five guys first and then figure out how they fit together 
All right, so let's let's segue into the fun topics of uh, NIL and the transfer portal. Uh, so we we got a thing we do on the website every Friday where it's called Friday Q and A. People ask Chris questions and he answers them. And as you can imagine, the last three weeks, all the questions have been about NIL, and we're actually not even answering. I'm not them. answering them because I don't know anything about we it. We don't know what to think. You know? um, so talk about NIL and where where you are as a program, and you know about where you are as a coach and how to deal with it. <laughs> he doesn't know either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's just a lot to there's a lot to unwrap there in terms of 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 what that means and what that is. First of all, let's make it clear: uh, coaches can have nothing to do with soliciting, um, for lack of a better term, sponsorship for the players, mm-hmm. or like, we can have nothing to do with it. But what we can do is provide them the resources uh, and the guidance to build their own brand. And, you know, a large percentage of that is through through social media. Being a really, really, really good player helps. You know, it certainly does. But that's not the only prerequisite. I mean, you've got, you've got people now that are, are genuine um, entrepreneurs that are now allowed to go do these things. You know, if you've got a guy that um, – you know, is, is genuinely interested in a clothing brand or whatever, he's allowed to go down that road by himself and, and try and try and make that work. You've got the the elite players that, that are gonna have a chance to uh, endorse products and, and earn earn money or, or give access to themselves and charge for that. And then you've got this kind of other group of maybe they're not uh, or maybe they're entrepreneurs in some sense of the word, but maybe they're not uh, interested in a conventional business model or they're not, um, you know, they're not the, the first round draft pick at quarterback, but they have some other marketable uh, skill or look that they feel like they can build that brand through social media and, and find a way to essentially pay, you know, charge for advertising. Now it's all supposed to be regulated. That's the problem, but nobody knows what the regulations are. So therein lies the the, the crux. I mean, the NCAA punted. You know, they spent a lot of time <laughs> fighting this, and and in my opinion, instead of finding a way for us to administer this. In my and and quite honestly, there's a lot of good things with this. Right. You know, like you know, there's a lot of things that if you if you really sit back and think about. Um, America, you know, and people's right to go earn a living, you, you, you feel pretty good about it. I just, my concern for it is I do not, um, I do not want to diminish our focus on the long game. Our focus on the long game is an education, not the 10 bucks you get for uh, or the hundred bucks you get for for signing an autograph or whatever, but our focus is on what can I do that's going to help me in forty years, not in the next you know forty minutes. Mm-hmm. And this does deter from that. But if we can find a way to get our young people to do some of this and get some of the things that I think most people want them to get, yeah. if they can, in a reasonable manner, right? You know, in a fair market manner. I don't think there's anything bad about that if we can find a way to make sh- ensure that that happens. But also make sure we're focused on what's actually really important. Mm. Okay, and and we all have the you know, we all have a little bit of age and experience on us, right? So we know a little bit better than the 18-year-olds about what actually is important. And that's the hard message to get across right. because basically we're telling them they can make all their own decisions. When we all know when they're not exactly ready for all their own decisions, they're ready for a lot of them, but maybe not all of them. So um, we have a team ready to help them uh, build their brand. We have ways for them to, um, to to monitor those things via social media and also determine price ranges and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's a, it, it's a, it's an interesting, uh, you know, to, to say we've opened Pandora's box would be an understatement, but it's it, it'll be interesting to see 
where it goes. I mean, it, it's got a chance to be positive, and it's got a chance to be the most ludicrous thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> yeah. So, so speaking of ludicrous, what goes through your mind when you hear that two Texas A&M football players are being paid $10,000 to do an interview? Yeah, I mean, that's um, – but by, by that, the way, Tech Sideline can't afford that. So. <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's the crux of this huge problem that's essentially been ignored. Is is that fair market value or not? You know, it's hard hard to justify that probably. Yeah. Right. But um, you know, if it had been uh, the quarterback at Clemson last year would that be fair market value i don't know maybe you know it's the number one pick in the draft i don't know like that's where it becomes are we just throwing money at people just for the sake of doing for it for the sake of it and and those that think that 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 if when it if it heads down that direction think that it won't affect the athletic departments in my opinion they're they're lying to themselves yeah. like the donor dollar is not doubling Right, the donor dollar is either going to go here or there. Mm-hmm. You know, historically, it's always gone to Virginia Tech for it to distribute to the to the players, either male or female, the best way they could see possible. Whether that was through new uniforms or nutrition or training or or strength coaches or whatever. You know, or now they have an option to give it directly to the player essentially, right. and you know that I don't think it's going to double. I think, you know, I mean, it's going to be they're, – they're all going to make a decision of which direction to put it. So, yeah. it's, it's going to be interesting. Anything from you? No. Uh, <laughs> you gave a much better answer than I've tried to <laughs> well, give. Well, all I did was talk in a big circle. Yeah. So, well, I mean, that's all anybody can do at this point. It's, it's a wild just, west aspect. I do think this – I should say this without belaboring the point. I, I do think we are uniquely positioned. As the number one sports brand in the state, 250,000 alumni, to benefit from this. You know, I, I, I do think we have this Virginia Tech football brand, particularly in the state of Virginia, that, that speaks to a lot of people. And we have a rabid um, alumni base or fan base that has always wanted to take care of our players in a, in a, in a legal way mm-hmm. right now now there is that opportunity it's just i can't be involved in it right. and they've, they've got to kind of go figure it out a little bit yeah so let's uh segue to another fun topic transfer portal um <laughs> I, I think that for for me observing it from the outside it, it brings attention to transfers that have, that have kind of always been there but it seems to put a lot of pressure on coaches and coaching staffs to you recruit the high school players to get them on your team and then is it fair or accurate to say that you have to continue recruiting the players on your team to keep them on your team? Um, yeah, well, I think um, uh, well, I think there's a long answer to that one too. Unfortunately yeah. for you guys, you have to listen to me for a minute. But um, you know, the de- th- things have changed dramatically in ten years. They changed dramatically in five years. But um, and I don't know that the portal itself makes you do anything differently in terms of of how you coach. I think the way kids have evolved makes you change. And they they know more than they ever have. I mean, they have the power, you know, never in the history of mankind have we had that much information at our own fingertips. So um, the days of do this because I said so, those are, those are gone. You know, those are over five, six years ago. Like, I think you could still do that six or seven years ago, but um, not anymore. And, and it's, it's just a, a different dynamic there, which I think you have to acknowledge. Um, you know, there is an element of this, you know, this, this, this transfer immediate eligibility deal that is like, I think should be addressed on the front end. Like, I think it should be addressed in recruiting. Like, listen, the second you step on our campus, you're a free agent. You can go anywhere you want. Are you going to stick to this thing and, and come here for the right reasons and understand that this is the process that we're putting in front of you and this is what this university can do for you and this is what we're, you know, I think it should be addressed up front. And uh, we did that in in the 21 class in, in the 
in the 22 class or are doing it in the 22 class. And I think it's it's going to be good. The other thing is, too, like, you know, two guys get get disciplined and 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 get booted out of school and 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 then on Twitter it's they're in the transfer portal. Well, that's right. not really what we're talking about. We're talking about right. the guy that and we've benefited more than anybody on this. We, you know, and we have you know, we had two two transfers that that hurt us. Um uh, but but not very many. Mm. And we've benefited greatly from it and I think you know, we have to do a great job keeping an eye on it and and trying to continue to evolve with the times so well, slightly off topic but how do you reconcile in your head being the virginia tech football coach and your ma- favorite musical artist is a uva guy dave matthews <laughs> well like okay yeah i mean he was born in south africa that's fair yeah, and that's he fair. grew up in in charlottesville but like i don't know that he like considers uh, maybe he does considers <laughs> of a uva guy Tiki Barber was in one of his videos. I remember. Was he? Yeah, well, he was. <laughs> I, I'll say this: like this is this is the only th- the only thing my only defense okay, is um, in 1995 uh, when I started listening to Under the Table and Dreaming, I was like, "This is awesome," and I had yet to be to Blacksburg, Virginia. Right? I'd yet right. to get to Blacksburg. Of course. So um, I don't know. It's just something that, like, kind of right when I was in high school going to college that was that was kind of coming on pretty strong and i had no idea the the twists and turns and in, in the road that were ahead of me well he used to play in blacksburg that's what i've heard that. i've talked to some older guys or maybe guys about my age uh maybe a little bit older that that talked about that were in fraternities at virginia mm-hmm. tech and talked about him him and he would make trips down and the yeah. music scene in blacksburg was pretty big back then so, so I, I lived in i lived in charlottesville from 87 through 94 and, and he was he was a thing right around that uh, i remember people yeah. going down to to by the way we haven't mentioned his name we're talking about dave matthews for those <laughs> of you who, who aren't clued in i also think we're seg- we're segueing to the fun with foo segment. are we and moving over out of business into play so this is I, 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 may, I, may, I may owe royalties to, to john laser for that but <laughs> yeah so we, we are copying we'll, we'll buy him a drink at acc kickoff this so, so we're, we're going to toss it over to uh evan and, and i'm probably going to rudely interrupt at, at some points so, so for those of you watching on the video evan's off camera but we do got him mic so take it away so coach i feel like one of the most beloved tech football players over the last 10 years sam rogers now the head football coach at Hanover High School. What do you think about the coach, Sam Rogers? Oh, he's he's going to be incredible. He's coming to see us on Friday. Uh, he's going to bring his his baby boy up. I think he's in town for a wedding, and uh, I'm just proud of him. Like this, is a guy that could go do anything he wants, right? Like the the coaching profession needs people like that. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't become a coach because he couldn't go do anything else. Yeah, he could have gone and done anything else he wanted, but he became a coach because he, he loves teaching. And we did this presentation in the in the springtime with our team. We did six subjects, and um, each was a 30-minute presentation. I had two of them. Hilgard had two of them. Uh, Pearson had one, and Mike Goforth had one. And um, one of, on one of mine, I asked I asked Sam to talk about it to talk about what hard, smart, and tough what meant to him and send it to me. And I was going to try and find a way to, to work it into the presentation. What I should have done is just had Sam come and present on it. <laughs> like I found out in a two-minute video that he could succinctly describe it and articulate it in, in two, and a half, two and a half minutes much better than I could in half an hour. What was it like, I mean, your first year getting to inherit a guy who's a senior like Sam and getting to coach him in his first year? Well... I just know leadership like that doesn't come along every day, you know. Like, I, I don't know if this story actually happened. I wasn't in the room. But I've been told that during fall camp we were covering the, the player, player manual. And uh, in the player manual, this may not even be true, but I'm going to tell it anyway. It's – it, it – said like when we go to the hotel though we don't we're not going to have movies we're going to have our meetings and then when we finish our meetings we're going to bed we're getting out and i think they had previously had movies like on the tv or whatever and so there 
uh, our director of ops was covering that, and there was some some grumbling, as you can imagine, like some some bitching and moaning about that. And I was told Sam turned around and said, "Y'all shut the hell up! Like we're here to win games, not here to watch movies." Like leadership like that, that's pretty special. And I don't know if that's just the legend of Sam Rogers, if that never happened, but that story's been passed down as a great example of a guy with real self confidence that basically said, "Guys, like y'all are complaining about it." That's something that's no big deal. Like, let's move on. That's a great story. Yeah, I know. If I'm, if I'm a team at Richmond right now, I wouldn't want to be playing the Hanover Hawks anytime no, soon. No, he'll have a hired Austin Cannon as his offense. Yeah, I think he did. I think you're right. Yeah. So, okay, so I, th- I guess there's a saying, Coach, that uh, people have said that you should stay in college as long as you can. And uh, I think Terrell Smith has certainly uh, lived <laughs> up to that. He's taking that to a new extreme. Right? So, I, I just looked it up just to make sure I had this right. He enrolled in the winter of 2014. To Virginia Tech. I mean, he went to prep school before that. That's right. So, so is he is he living the dream? Would you say right now? Well, he's either living a dream or he's just <laughs> stuck in stuck in this <laughs> vicious cycle. You know, the thing that's cool about that is is I mean, obviously there's some circumstances there that are beyond his control between getting hurt and and COVID and all that sort of stuff. But first of all, I think it speaks um, volumes that one that we actually want him around like there's plenty of guys that you're you're ready for them to graduate and move on um (laughs) two that he wants to stay around and and three the transformation that we've seen you know from him um from from you know younger player um he's a self-admitted like um you know you know he wasn't always a straight and narrow guy you know like he he uh He's kind of a reformed turd, you know, like he's like now a leader and now a great guy that everybody wants to be around. But I think there was a time when he was – people were on his butt all the time. And, you know, to see that growth is is pretty cool. But um, I'm sure, I'm almost positive this is the last go around. This will be it. This will be it. <laughs> <laughs> Leaves with uh, maybe three or four degrees, right, when it's all yeah, said I mean, done. Yeah, I mean, it should so. be a doctor. <laughs> All right, so next two questions kind of take you down memory lane a little bit. First one, uh, it's really cool to walk through the Merriman Center and see the video board that has the NFL draft a couple of years ago of Tremaine and Terrell both getting picked in the first round. You were there for that. Looking back on that and seeing the careers they've had, I mean, what was that like to to see NFL history be made, two players you coach get taken in the first round together as brothers? Well, it was, uh, to, first of all, to be included in it was really cool. You know, they didn't have to, to bring us. And to get to kind of tag along and see it was was, was really cool. Um, but everybody knew Tremaine was going early. We didn't know where. We didn't know when or whatever. But we all knew. Everybody knew that was going to happen. And Terrell uh, was was on the bubble. You know, like was, you know, was maybe going to be a – a second round nobody really knew his grade came back second round but nobody really knew and then to have the elation of getting Tremaine drafted I think it was 11th but anyway it was early and then like the uncertainty of okay Tremaine's off doing his thing getting his picture and all that sort of stuff and we're kind of like hanging out and we don't know what's going to go and then all of a sudden I'll never forget Terrell literally comes running from under the stage he's been in the restroom he's tucking his shirt in and trying to button his belt because he's just been drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers <laughs> and uh it's like I wasn't like I didn't know exactly what was going on but mama jumps up and everybody jumps up and we realize what just happened and uh, it's something I'll remember. I'll remember forever. It's pretty cool. So one of the greatest moments of his life happened in the bathroom. Well, he was in the bathroom. I get no idea. He's in the restroom, he comes running out, and he's tucking his shirt in and buttoning his his belt and all that sort of stuff. So I'm sure you are so excited to have Lane Stadium back, packed this year, fans back in the stands. So another question down memory lane. I'm curious. You know that the when Enter Sandman starts that walk that you guys has of a team, you hear the crowd. Are they? Any memorable Enter Sandman's that you can remember off the top of your head when you're standing at that tunnel saying, wow, this crowd is jumping today? Oh, I think the night ones are, are just a little different. I don't know if it's the extra time for the, for the fans to get ready in the parking lot or, or what. But, I, I, you know, the night ones to me with the, with the lights on, that, that's pretty cool. And um, yeah, not that it's not all cool, but, I mean, to me, when you come walking out of there, because it's a really – 
we know Blacksburg's a beautiful place during the day, but when you get around our facility and the stadium at night, when the weather's nice and the lights are on, it's really, it's really pretty. It's really a special place. So, you know, all of the night ones I think are, are pretty unique. I cannot wait to get people back in there. And, you know, it's such a, it's such a fellowship event at Virginia Tech. Our fans come to participate. They don't come to be entertained. They come to actively try and help us win the game. And, um, you know, all the relationships and families and friends that, that hang out in the, in the parking lots and tailgate and have such a wonderful time, we've, we've, we've been deprived of that. And I felt like I saw a little glimpse of it in Richmond yesterday. You know, yeah. I felt like that was like a everybody's just kind of itching on the edge of their seats to get back out there and have a good time. All right, last one for you. I know on Tech Talk Live, you and Lays love to talk about your love of uh, Cobra Kai. <laughs> and uh, it was nominated for an Emmy recently. I don't know if you saw that. Was it really? So I, I saw Lays was very excited about that on Twitter. What, what, was, it, what was it nominated for specifically? I, I, I don't remember okay. off the top of my head, but uh, I got raving reviews. But I'm curious, before we let you go, what are you watching on Netflix these days? Anything? Any time for TV? You know, I, ha I, I haven't, like, like, I keep waiting on – on some of my shows to come back. Like, I don't know what the deal is with those arcs. Is it over? Is it coming back? Season four. I'm a, I just watched it. Final season, season's season. coming up in a couple months. Season okay. four will be the last season. And okay. It's coming. Like I keep waiting on that. I keep waiting on Yellowstone, which I haven't seen. Like, I don't know when it's, it's coming. So I haven't like, I haven't, I've been searching. I've been like a ship out in the sea, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been bobbing around. I started, I'd never seen house of cards. I started to get into that a little bit. Yeah. It seems like it's pretty good. So I'm kind of like, I could say that's what I'm into right now, trying to figure out if I want to stick it out or not. It's I, a weird show. I, I just yeah. finished House of Cards. It's uh, it's really? it's dark, I feel like, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but it's I, good. I, I didn't finish that one. Have, have you seen Peaky Blinders? Uh, no. Now, um, somebody else was telling me. Not a family that. show. If you can get <laughs> don't that, aren't they heavily accented in, or did I make that up? I'll just say I play it with closed captioning on. It's, oh, it's, so you yeah. can make sure you – yeah, yeah. yeah, I got you. Yeah, you're going to miss a lot if you don't have a closed yeah. captioning. Okay. I've heard it's good. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah. Well, that was uh, our fun with food, and that's coming no, up. Now, wait a minute. I got, I got a related question. Um, <clears throat> are you a movie guy? Do you have a favorite movie of all time? Like if somebody asks you what's your favorite movie of all time, what do you say? I love, I love movies. Uh, my <laughs> dad always loved movies. Um going to the movie theater. I remember the first movie I ever saw was Jungle Book. It was a cartoon. And my dad liked talking to me about how quiet I had to be in the movie theater, <laughs> you know. But um, I absolutely love movies. And I grew up I grew up in the 80s era of the of Indiana Jones and, and Star Wars and all that sort of stuff, which I've always loved, you know. But as far as, like, the best movie I've ever seen – you know, these are two vastly different movies, but, you know, Shawshank Redemption is incredible. And um, I would say in addition to that, the most unique movie I ever saw was Pulp Fiction. Got to be Pulp Fiction. And it was yeah. like, I can't believe, like, this is in incredible. I can't believe they put this on, like, I don't know, that was the most unique movie that I ever enjoyed. Like, we can all make a crummy movie that sure. nobody understands, but that I actually enjoyed was Pulp Fiction. Yeah, the way that one bends time is is, is really cool. It's pretty fascinating. So, so there's really two things you can talk about. The the movies themselves, good movies, and then there's some movies that resonate with you at a certain point in your life. Oh, certainly. And for yeah. me, that's Risky Business. It came out when I was a <laughs> senior in high school. Nobody's going to say that's the greatest movie ever made. Right. There, There is a good blending of music and some of the stuff that happens in that movie. Yeah. But for me, when you ask me that question, that's what I answer because it just resonated at that point in my yeah. life. For Chris, I think it's Euro Trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not very deep when it goes to me. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I personally look forward to Tech Talk Live coming back and uh, fun with who every week. I mean, it's it's a great way to close the show. So. I love. Yeah, I love that part of it. You know, like I do enjoy. I, if I had one wish, it would it would be that I understand we got to talk ball, but um, it doesn't have to be about me, but. You know, I wish we could sometimes spend more time just talking about what's going on. And because um, I'm interested in that, you know, like I enjoy uh, reading about about it, whether it's through sports or, or yeah. other things. But I understand ball balls, the balls, the deal. But it's kind yeah. of fun to drift off topic every yeah. now and again. Yeah. We always have a chair and a microphone here, coach, anytime. So awesome. 
I'm looking at you, Pete Morris. <laughs> <laughs> Pete's nodding. He's nodding. I don't know what the nod means. Anyway, appreciate you coming in and taking your time. Uh, have a good time down there at the uh, ACC football kickoff. Chris and David Cunningham and I will be down there. Um, I'm not real fond of the ballroom scene, but I do like the breakouts afterwards. Yeah, where, me too. Those yeah. are the most enjoyable parts. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's uh, – you know, having followed your career here, that's – one of the times where you seem to be the most relaxed is when you're in the breakouts afterwards. Yeah. So we'll see you down there. And again, thank you for your time. And this has been episode 184, Evan? 184. Of the TSL podcast sponsored by the Southeast Regional Training Center. Coach, thanks. And we'll see you all again next time. Awesome. Thank you. All right.